This is Dave once again from the Wolves Den saying, Happy Tuesday. It's time for AIR Radio. And Jennifer Hillman will be back in just a few minutes with her guest. Good morning, everyone. This is Jennifer Hillman, and this is Abstract Illusions Radio here on Worth Spirit Radio. Today we have Monty Taylor, who is an Enduring, and I know I said that wrong, Enduring, um, astrologer. He is an amazing astrologer and a great guy who also studies a lot about mythology, which they are interconnected. And with all the energy going on and the special birth yesterday on his birthday, so a belated happy birthday to Monty, I welcome you to the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you, Jennifer. (laughs) Now, can I ask real quick, because we talked earlier, and you're at the U.N. right now. What exactly are you doing at the U.N.? Oh, I do a lot of uh, coordination work uh, for cultural events, lectures, uh, little concerts, uh, but mostly events that uh, are designed to raise consciousness. The U.N. is an amazing multifaceted organization. It has many, many buildings to it, and there are many clubs, societies, and uh, advisory committees that have ongoing lecture series about anything, about uh, lifting yourself into higher consciousness, living more holistically in the world. And, you know, all my life I've been filling theaters with people and putting something on the stage that was relevant, so that's what I'm doing here. That's beautiful. So people don't know don't know about you. You actually were part of the New York Opera Company for thirty some years. Yeah, worldwide. I went around the world three times. I managed international opera singers, concert violinists, pianists, symphony orchestras, conductors, uh, because that was a passion of mine. To me, music helps to raise consciousness. Classical music is balanced. Mm-hmm. It is very healthy. It is a wonderful tool for healing and insight. And I just, since I was six years old, that's all I ever wanted to do. So when I stopped teaching college, I started uh, doing it. And I had a wonderful, successful uh, agency. But really what I was, was I was an educator. I used to arrange articles in the major media on famous classical musicians in order to make them relevant. I used to try to teach people that Classical music is just popular music from another era, uh, that it isn't il- elite, it's not exclusive, it's simple beauty, just like something in the mm-hmm. museum would be, but it's not a museum piece, it's alive and organic, but that was my passion, so yeah, I put a lot of people on the stage at Carnegie Hall in my day. <laughs> that's That's wonderful, I mean... And art overall, that self-expression and that beauty within art really is the highest vibration to me on this planet, especially music. Um, And it really is a healing element that really needs to be promoted and embraced in any and all ways you can get it. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, we always say beauty is the doorway to higher consciousness. Very good. That's awesome. Now, I mean, just listening to you, and you really have continued to embrace really showing people tools and ways to get to the higher consciousness. Even with your astrology, you basically, it's a tool for you to understand yourself, but to rise above and beyond what it does, correct? Absolutely. Uh, there's nothing fatalistic about astrology. It's a live, organic energy pattern. Uh, the word horoscope means picture of the hour. And you, so your horoscope or your natal birth chart is nothing but a picture of the sky uh, the moment you were born as seen from where you're born. And it shows how you're kind of wired to the universe, how the universe works through you, how you see the world. And the more self-aware you are, the more you can create your life rather than just administrate the things that happen to you into some kind of understandable format. So, yeah, it's absolutely true. And mythology is the language we use Mm -hmm. to allegorically explain these higher consciousness abstract concepts. And that is something that throughout history people have really 
kind of honed in on those mythology to really express the the human experience. Yeah. Yeah, um, Carl and, Jung, the great psychologist Carl Jung, was a master astrologer, and he was kind of like the Rosetta Stone. He finally connected all the dots and realized that the mythologies that explain certain concepts of body, mind, spirit were what we were applying to planetary positions and transits. So it's a very poetic way of saying things. Um, one of my particular models I say in my lectures a lot is that quantum metaphysics, everyone talks about metaphysics, but metaphysics is only quantum physics poetically expressed, quite simply. And a beautiful way of saying it. Is there a mythology story right now that's really present with the planet and the energy? Because we're going through a, a huge shift in a way. Yeah. Um, is we there, are. and it, is there one that really sticks out that really is present in your mind about this energy? Well, a lot of what I'm uh, talking about with my clients and on my radio show and on all of my lectures right now is something we don't have every day, like 120 years we have it, and it is the planet Uranus, which is the planet of innovation, beginning, uh, enlightenment. It uh, doesn't mean it gives you truth. It means it gives you a fresh new perspective so you can find truth. It's the wild card planet that causes uh, the developments very rapidly with technology and things. And that planet right now is making a competitive or square angle in the sky to another planet, and the mythology connected with it is Pluto, the underworld, which really, in the ancient Greek mind, uh, Pluto in the underworld was the unconscious. It wasn't heaven or hell. In fact, in the mythologies of the underworld in ancient Greece, heaven, Elysium, and hell, Tartary, were both in the same place. And great poets have often said that the mind is its own place and can make a hell of heaven or a heaven of hell. So mm -hmm. it's where you go to regenerate. So here we have innovation on a mass global conscious level, challenging transformation. So when you have, if you're going to transform, you better not just be going around in circles. You want to take a step upward in your awareness. And so... If you look at the way these planets, and they're, they're squaring each other five, seven times, actually. Uh, we got three more to go uh, over the next year. And uh, it is sort of like a sledgehammer banging away at an old rock that's in the way so you can make a road. And it's nothing is ever wrong. You see, astrology never takes away anything we need. It will take away things we think we need if they are taking us off path. So right now you are seeing, I mean, if you just look at your parents' generation or your grandparents' generation, there were no cell phones, there were no computers. Look at how different people thought then. Look at how different life was. Uh, now we have this instant global communication, and this is what is happening. Now, it's going to cause innovation, and when you block innovation or evolution, when you block it, you get mutation which is uncontrolled change. So uh, what's going on right now is look at the economy. It's got to change its structure and its system and its form. In fact, uh, Pluto, that planet we talked about, about transformation, just entered last year or two years ago the sign of Capricorn. Capricorn happens to rule governments, banking, structures of any kind. It rules the structure of the world economy. And here it's being challenged by innovation. So we are now a global economy that is seeking birth and seeking integration so that it can function instead of being fragmented all over the place. And whenever these planets encounter stuck energy or fundamentalism, it has a field day triggering crisis. You see, astrological transits don't really cause anything, in my opinion. What they do is they trigger potentials that are in your chart, or the country's chart, or the corporation's chart. Anything that had a beginning has a birth chart, and you can find out a lot about it. I have a lot of Wall Street people come to me 
and I do their chart and I do the natal chart of their company or corporation or brokerage to see how well they are compatible with each other. It's an extraordinary art. It really is, and it really will help mm-hmm. kind of navigate where you're going. Yeah. The, the, interesting, the interesting thing is Capricorn is actually going opposite the U.S. sun, which is really mm-hmm. a whole other level of crisis that a lot of people are saying it's time for the U.S. to really build up from its foundation again, to really find itself again. Do you yes. agree that's, that's basically what's going totally, on? Yeah, to find itself again. You know, right now we're having a perfect storm of planetary patterns, we're having the planetary returns of the American Revolution re-triggering it. So America has to revolutionize who it is. We're also having the planetary returns that triggered the Civil War. Just look at the country. It's all mm-hmm. polarized, totally, just like the Civil War. And we're having the planetary returns of the great stock market crash of 1929. And 2008 was only the beginning. It doesn't have to be bad and horrible and full of tragedy, but it does have to be allowed to express itself through massive change. And the more overdue the change is, the more intense it seems to us while it's happening. So here you have these three major events, all having planetary returns, which are triggering those events in the consciousness of the citizens of the United States and in its government. So it's every astrologer has been expecting this for years. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's a cycle. Time is a cycle, you know. So there's really no destination. There's only resting points along the way of this big spiral journey we're taking in consciousness throughout the universe. And so is there any, I mean, astrology to me is just kind of like, as I said, a tool to understand the yes. basic principles of what you are and go beyond. So yes. what is what is the best way in your way to use this tool to the highest degree to really help people get through this? Well, what I find is lacking in generic everyday astrology is people don't really understand why the planets were assigned the duties and roles that they play in our consciousness. They are overlooking the symbolism. They don't know their mythology. Now, Every culture has its own mythology, Aztec, Celtic, uh, Vedic, Mm -hmm. you know, India. And they're all 100% accurate, and they all do say the same thing, but they say it in very, very different ways. So it's like coming back to a starting point when you have every day, every year you have a birthday, and the sun comes back to where it was when you were born. It's like a a, a landmark, and doesn't everyone on their birthday sort of, look back and see what they've done and look forward Mm -hmm. and see what they want to do. It's just a point of perspective. Now, all planets have returns. Uh, That means they come back to where they were when something began. Some planets take so long to go around the zodiac that human beings don't have returns of them. Like nobody has a, a planetary return of the planet Pluto because you'd have to be 248 years old to have that. But countries have that. Corporations can have that. So you have to look at these rebirth plants that are going on. You know, the word zodiac, everybody talks about it so cavalierly. But zodiac in the ancient Greek means wheel of animals. And so there you have your zodiac. You have the lion and the tiger and the bear and, you know, the Chinese dogs and uh, Mm -hmm. the rat and everything. Now, The zodiac is where we got the concept of the merry-go-round. So life is very similar to that. It's an allegory. You have this merry-go-round, this wheel of animals. You're born, you incarnate, you get on one. Cancer the crab, Leo the lion, whatever. And every time those planets come back to where they were when you were born, something will get triggered in your own consciousness and your own value system so that you'll know how to handle what seemingly can be confusing. So astrology can give you the big picture, the overview, and it can give you the underview as well. What drives, what emotional, psychological factors are going on in your life that are causing you to react certain ways? 
And one thing I've learned with astrology, especially when you apply Carl Jung, the Jungian astrology to it, is that uh, there's a big difference between reacting, which is unconscious, and uh, responding, which is conscious. So when you respond with awareness, you can actually start directing the energies in your life. But when you're just reacting out of a habitual way of thinking, then you're kind of getting stuck. And it's it's no fun to be stuck. Been there, done that, got yeah, through it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, everybody has. Countries do it, too. And the more fundamentalist the viewpoint of life is, the more they are vulnerable to stuck energy. There's a difference between stuck energy and solid foundation. Definitely. You know, there's an interesting story that you and your listeners might want to know. You know, the ancient, the ancient, the founders of the American Revolution, Benjamin Franklin, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Paul Revere, were all master astrologers, and they were all Freemasons, and uh, they knew a lot about esoteric analogies. The planet Uranus, which causes breakthroughs and revolutions, was just being discovered when they wrote the Declaration of Independence. But let's just really quickly look at what they did. They set up originally for the United States' birthday to be in the sign of cancer. Okay, that sign is all about nurturing. It's about home. It's about feeling you belong to the clan and the tribe. So the United States was a very American mom and apple pie kind of mentality from the very beginning. Then they set up the elections to take place in November. That's the sign of Scorpio, which is all about death and resurrection and regeneration. So the elections were set up in an energy, which could be used well or badly, that would promote regeneration, perpetual regeneration, just the way your skin cells re renew themselves every day. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, so that was really good. And always, up until Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the president was always inaugurated in March. People forget that. And March is the sign of Pisces, transcendence, inspiration, idealism, so that the president would be very idealistic and noble and all of these things. Now, when Congress changed the inauguration of the president from March during Roosevelt's years, to January so that the calendar would be more convenient for them. They made the president be inaugurated under the sign of Capricorn, and Capricorn rules bureaucracy. And bureaucracy immediately became the fourth invisible, non-elected branch of the American government. Isn't that interesting? Very interesting. Mm. So That shows they didn't know what they were doing with planetary energies, you see. That just no. there was a lack of awareness. Astrology right. didn't cause that, but you use it a certain way, you're going to get a certain result. So do you think with a transition that is going on, there is a possibility that we'll go back to the way it was to find that balance again? No, because I think like losing the great library of Alexandria and all these wonderful things, I think we've lost a lot of our memory and our education, and too many things have changed. Um, I don't think we'll go back to what it was, but I think we will move into something very radically different. I was saying in my lectures three years ago that there was an impending constitutional crisis or the equivalent mm -hmm. of it, and there has been. Congress is completely dysfunctional. Uh, it, it is totally inept. Why? Not because they're stupid people, but because something is playing itself out. So what will happen is I think you're going to find uh, a different relationship between regional state governments or regions even of the country and the central government. And I think the division of power will be really re-evaluated again the way they had to do it after the Civil War, which they say was all about states' rights. And now you're hearing all about states' rights from everything right. from gay marriage to inheritance to everything. It's up to the state. Well, then the states can become very fundamentalists, you know. You have uh, fundamentalism and everything. And so you have the religious right in this country. I call them the Christian Taliban uh, because they're behaving in the same style. You see what I'm saying? Yes. Uh, so there will be a very, I mean, it's already happened. You see, in fact, even in Wall Street, uh, the chaps come up and talk to me as an astrologer and 
what I tell them, I say, listen, what you're fearing has already happened. You're just now finding out about it. <laughs> yeah. Well, they say everything that is happening to you has already had, it, you just haven't caught up with it yet. That's exactly right. Now, that's a revolutionary way of thinking compared to what we've had the last three or four centuries. And uh, that is, you know, even the Bible says the truth will set you free. Well, right. truth is relevant, too. But it's when you suddenly become aware of things, you think you've discovered them. No, they've always been there. You know. Yeah. It's, it's a kind of a humorous thing, the joke that the, we play on ourselves. That's all about Hermes, you know, playing tricks on us, using what we know to fool ourselves, you see. Well, otherwise we take life too serious. <laughs> Yeah, Sweet. and it, it, it's very simple. If anyone has ever driven in a bad snowstorm or a fog, and uh, mm -hmm. you turn up your bright lights, you know, to try to see better, what you're doing is blinding yourself, aren't you? So right. that's what we're doing allegorically. You know, we're surrounded by all this change and confusion, and we try to try to take what we think we know and ramp it up and project it onto the, the surroundings. And all we're doing is blinding ourselves with our own knowledge because we have to see there's a higher dimension of it that we have to integrate. So, Yes. And you, um, you mentioned that way back when, um, which brings up the point of the royals. And, you know, the, the new baby was born yesterday on your birthday. Smart guy. Right. And... He was also born on Alexander the Great's birthday. <laughs> wow. Powerful guy. Yeah. Now, looking mm -hmm. at his charts, is there anything we should look to happen with this guy? Well, I've just quickly glanced at it. I haven't studied it. But at first glance, this baby's chart looks like he is going to be an extraordinarily effective administrator. Uh, he will have enormous executive ability. He will be very peace-loving. He will be trying to balance opposing views. He has a Libra ascendant. That's the sign of the diplomat, trying to find balance rather than conflict and dominance. Uh, he'll have an enormous, and he's got a stellium of planets, like five or six planets, in the house of career. So he'll probably be very dedicated to whatever version of royalty he'll embrace in 40 years or whatever, when it's his time to come to the throne. Which but he'll is, be very charismatic, and he'll be very, very powerful. Mm -hmm. Yes. It, it's interesting that this generation, William and Kate, has really brought back hope for the monarchy in some ways. Mm -hmm. Yes, it, they have. I mean, it's like they're modern, they're together. They really connect with the everyday man, even though they're royals. Yes, they've humanized royalty. That's really exactly, what and and it's really beautiful. Um, Diana started the process, and it's great that she continue. It's continuing with William and Harry. Actually, they're both very involved in really helping the planet in the most up way. You know, they have their problems. Everybody does, but overall, mm -hmm. they really have embraced humanity which is so important to right. the mother so right. it's really it's really interesting so with that with what's going on now and the planets today you mentioned uranus is there any other planets that are really i mean i know that mercury is now going direct slowly um yeah. and and it's really trying we i mean yesterday we also had the full moon Yes. And the grand water trine that was supposed to bring a lot of positive energy around as well. Yeah. So yeah. how is that influencing, influencing us now or helping us move forward? Well, one thing I'd like to point out, all the things you just described about the grand trine in water and the full moon, all of those things are in the new royal baby's natal chart mm -hmm. for his whole life. That's going to be interesting. Now, uh, right now, we are in a kind of a smoother sailing period in a time of great tumultuous change. Change is not tumultuous unless it's resisted. Mm -hmm. So uh, right now, Mercury is in Cancer. We have a full moon. The moon rules Cancer. The full moon was in Aquarius, which rules uh, emotional freedom. 
So we're looking at the way we are looking at life. We're reanalyzing our viewpoints unconsciously and emotionally and seeing why do I feel emotionally so reactive to something or so responsive to something else. What it is, it's an opportunity. I mean, when you have good, clear weather, you can go out and work in the garden. You can ignore that and do something else and clean the attic. That's not the best time to do that, right? right. You want to do, you want to align with the energies going. So right now, when you start looking at yourself as part of a more collective, evolving consciousness that is global, and Aquarius is all about equality. But it's not about equality at the expense of being an individual. So it wants to honor everybody's individuality, but it wants all that individuality to balance itself in harmony. And the solution to any problem is brought about by balance, not conquest. Conquest is temporary. Balance is much more permanent. Yes, it is. The other thing about uh, Aquarius, it's ruled by Uranus. So we go full circle. Exactly. Right? Yes. So you got and, that erratic uh, energy within that too. Yes, you do. So it's about, you see, Aquarius really is not a touchy-feely kind of emotional, sentimental energy. But it's an incredibly loyal, steadfast energy. So it wants loyalty without codependency. That is what it's really trying to give us. And when you stop and think about it, I think most people equate loyalty with codependency or codependency right. being badly expressed loyalty. No, it's a, there's a big difference. There's a big, big difference. So um, allowing everyone to be who they are while you remain who you are and find the balance, and that's where the individual change and evolution can happen. And there's a big difference between change and evolution, you know. I was talking to my brother-in-law recently who was dying, and he says, oh, Monty, I can't get into all this metaphysical stuff, you know. I know it makes people feel better, but I just can't change. And I said to him, well, uh, we're not asking you to change. We're asking you to stay who you are but evolve. Ever try that approach? And it seemed to get through. So if for somebody who doesn't understand the difference, can you explain it? The difference between co a codependence or change in evolution? Change in evolution. Well, let's say, um, here's a good example. Once I was asked by a very famous Tibetan astrologer to uh, read her chart, and she would read mine. Well, it was really interesting. The charts both said kind of the same things, didn't change. They changed the style. But mm -hmm. the Tibetan astrologer was very worried. She said, you know, you should make an erasure here. You should erase this line of the circle so that there's just a little space so that the soul doesn't feel to be trapped in the circle of the chart. And I said, well, the, it's not trapped because every time a planet goes around, let's say your birthday again, and it brings the same things up in your mind. And if you take a step upwards in your awareness, you're creating a spiral. And one of my great teachers once told me, Monty, a circle is nothing but a loop. Truth lies in the spiral. That's why we have spiral galaxies and spiral DNA and all of that stuff. So evolution is repeating something and learning from it every time you repeat it. Change is just changing the style in which you cope with it without going up in your own understanding of why you keep having the same thing repeated in your life. Does right. that help? That helps. Um, the other thing that um, that also is about the evolution that I mentioned to you is the fact that it's very interesting to me how the stepping stones in one's life. It's like everything that's in their plan is really interconnected. You learn something, you expand it to a different level, and you bring it to another level. And within it all, it really is connected, that interconnection and that interdependence that really brings you to your high potential. Right. You're and, absolutely and I, right. And it's, I find that even with 
the charts and everything, it really shows you a bit, especially with the mythology, how it's it's bringing you to a higher level of yes, understanding. I love the fact that you use the word stepping stones. And what I have found with my years of practice in this is that most people get on a stepping stone and they don't go any further. They set up camp and start trying to live on the stepping stone. <laughs> We're not realizing this is an experience that's meant to bring me somewhere else, somewhere forward. And that's how the spiral happens again. Every time you come back, people say, oh, I've come back home. Well, you come back for a visit to get your bearings so that you can go on another voyage. Right. You know, the great mythologies, everyone knows Jason and the Argonauts. And everyone knows the Odyssey about how Odysseus is trying to get home to Ithaca and it's taking him 20 years. Well, those are allegorical stories in mythology. One, Jason and the Argonauts, is frankly 500 years older than the Odyssey. And Jason and the Argonauts were going outward into the universe. They were going for the quest. They were looking for the Golden Fleece. They were sailing through unknown territory. Well, that's a really noble way to navigate life. And then the other one is the Odyssey, where Odysseus, after being victorious at the fall of Troy, wanting to finally go home to his wife and son, is trying to get home again. And both journeys, the journey outward and the journey home again, are equally dangerous and fraught with all kinds of challenges and adventures unless you know what you're doing. It's a wealth of knowledge. It really is. And for me, writing things down that happen and going back and say, wow, that's really interesting, and just moving on. It's like each section of my life is like this chapter in this grand book. So it's like I'm writing to kind of remind myself of where I've been so I can move forward without getting yeah. stuck. It's like being on that this, right. That stepping stone, it's like if you stay in one stepping stone, that's when you feel stuck. That's right. And look how people do that. They make their job a stepping stone. Maybe that right. was supposed to be something they were supposed to learn and move forward. Maybe it's a relationship that you outgrow and you stay there because you want to be loyal or you just don't have another one lined up already. And that's just how people get themselves trapped in their own thinking. And when I hear those things, I get quite amused, actually. Been there, done that. I can't say I haven't been stuck. Like you said, we all get stuck sometimes. But I look back yeah. at the places I got stuck and compare it even on the charts and stuff, and I just bust out laughing um, yeah. at, at the place. It's like right now, as you know, and the audience probably knows, um, I'm in my cry on return. So it's like all my wounds are coming up, and I'm laughing at some of the things that I've done. And just mm -hmm. walking through it. But I feel like it's good to see those wounds and how I've healed them. Yes. To the major the message next. of that, yeah. That, and one only gets one Chiron return in life unless they, unless they live to be 104. Uh, but the Chiron return is all about going to a higher level of perspective. It teaches all of us that you can't fight negativity on its own level, you will only make it stronger, like cutting off the heads of the hydra, two board roll back. Chiron is about completely and totally looking at something from above, from a higher perspective, so that you get a completely different approach to the way you're handling something. So, and Chiron returns are very powerful, and they are the ultimate healing return that a person can have. So it's... Uh, I'm very glad that you mentioned that. Again, and if you look at Chiron, the first thing he taught all of his pupils was the form of Zen archery, saying that if you keep yourself focused on the target or your life's goals, they can change. But keep yourself focused on what you're trying to do, like driving your car down the road. Uh, stay focused. Uh, and But if you start looking at everything else around you, like the bowl in your the bow and the tightness of it and the feathers in your arrow and the wind, you're giving yourself all these uh, distractions as to why you should not reach your goal. And the most extraordinary thing is once Chiron realized in order to cure his own incurable wound, 
Remember, he was an immortal who could never die physically, and he had a wound that could never be healed. Aha, look at that allegory. And so what happens when he finally, as a long, long story, too long for the show here, uh, he asks to be ascended, and Zeus took him and placed him in the sky and renamed him Sagittarius the Archer. Uh -huh. And recently, this myth is 6,000 years old, but it's allegorical because recently the Hubble telescope discovered the center of our galaxy. And it happens to not only be in Sagittarius from our perspective, but it's at 28.55 degrees Sagittarius, which is at the tip of Sagittarius' arrow. Mm -hmm. Isn't that amazing? Yes. So you're getting to the real core of things in life. Yes. No more and, distraction. And, and um, being born on the 18th of December, 26 degrees Sag, I know yeah. very well that very, um, that energy um, of yeah. that connection. And it's... It's very interesting, the galactic center and um, the power within. Um, yeah. So it's it's interesting that there are actually some astrologers that really focus mainly on the outer planets versus the inner right. because there are longer transition and effect on people. Right. They have a longer effect. They are more powerful. The further away a planet is from the actual Earth, the more powerful its effect is. And the outer planets affect world cycles and the population in general. Uh, the inner planets, the closer planets, they affect everyday life. Uh, there's, of course, sometimes they're all working together and we can see it. But that's basically what's happening. And we are expanding our global consciousness and realizing we're not the center of the universe. We're on the, one of the wings of a tiny little galaxy among trillions and billions beyond counting. So it's this infinity that we're facing. Are we equipped to look at infinity in a logical manner? That's what's happening. It's it's really a powerful time. It's there's yeah. is a lot a lot of people that say, Wow, it's really a blessing. Even though it may be tough to get through, it is really yeah. amazing time to be alive. It certainly is. And you would see that because your son from that birth date is in alignment with the galactic center. So cosmic consciousness comes naturally to you. You really, I'm sure, have felt most of your life like you haven't been living with your own species, right? No. I, I've I've been on the other side, shall we say. Um, I'm yes. more comfortable in that element of the oneness in a lot of ways. And yes. um, it's it's interesting that in 2003, I actually was in a head-on collision, went to the other side and felt that immense mm -hmm. blissful love and just it's yes. overwhelming. And then to come it's back here, cool. it's, mm -hmm. oh, my God, it's just like, do I really have to be down here? Because it was That's so... That's what I meant. You don't feel like this is where you belong. No. no. But you see, you're one of those individuals who very valiantly volunteered to bring heaven to earth and teach people to stop trying to escape their earthly consciousness in order to find heaven. No, go up in higher consciousness and bring it down here and ground it in your everyday life. That's the real mission. Yes, and I've had to go through those lessons to do it myself to help other people do it. Um, yeah. and, and, and that's the crown. That's basically what I'm really getting right now is just as, as I got a message from in meditation, everybody's trying to get home and it's heaven on mother earth or it's hell on mother earth. It's really yeah. up to you, which it is. So, and, and I just, they keep saying, you want to be home? It's up to you what kind of home you're on. <laughs> so. Um, embrace your lessons, embrace the moment, and focus on the love because that's what everybody is, is loved in love. And and once you embrace that and just focus on that, everything unfolds beautifully. It really Certainly. can. It's so self it, itself. You're right. Mm -hmm. it, it's it's self it's self creation self correcting at every point. You just need to be open to the correction. Yeah. And not resist it. Yeah, and the problem is most people don't realize that something needs correcting, <laughs> and they don't. And they don't want to give up their narrow vision of how they live and who they are. Exactly, um, and the potential is so great 
for everything here. And it's, you know, it's, that's a blessing for me being on a radio show. And where I am is I meet beautiful people like you who really, with your work at the UN, with your astrology, your radio show, which I do want to talk about in a second, you know, I want to thank you for the work you do. Because you're really helping the earth go to that higher vibration daily. So I thank you very much. Thank you. So lovely Um, to be here. I appreciate it. And I think that's the other thing that people aren't getting enough of. Acknowledgement and thanks for what they're doing. Right. And and, and that's something I always try and do because we're all here for a reason to work together. So... Mm -hmm. No, you're not alone, and it's all good. And speaking of not being alone, you speak to a lot of radio listeners yourself on your show. Tell us about yeah. it. What, what was your journey to it, and what is it all about for you? Well, the show just fell into my lap one day. Uh, someone said, would you like to, you know, and people seem to like my lectures. They say, Monty, when we go to your lectures, we think we're going to be bored, and it turns out to be like some kind of Shakespearean nightclub act. It's funny. It's everything. I just try to make it relevant. And I said, well, okay, let me try this. So I have a show called Living Consciously, and it's on an Internet radio channel called uh, TalkingAlternative.com. And we are in 110 countries now, as of last count. And uh, I sit there and I watch all the technicians do their magic because I can't even, I can hardly send an email. But they um, have this big screen that shows us how many listeners are in every city. And to my surprise, my big audience is in Japan, China, Korea, Thailand, Vietnam, and then Russia and Europe and South America, especially Bogota, Colombia. And, uh, of course, across the U.S. as well. And it's kind of a thrill to do it. You know, I do a fresh show every week, and I customize the music for it, and I research on things that are relevant to the times. And it's an amazing uh, experience. I get lots of fan mail. I'm very humbled by that. It's nice to know that people are listening and that it's relevant to them. So I always say, if you try to do whatever it is you do and make it relevant to the big picture, it's going to be effective. So it's living consciously at talkingalternative.com. And I, it's live on Mondays, uh, Eastern Time, New York Time, noon Mondays, 12 o'clock noon. Uh, but it's archived, and you can listen to the show for up to 10 weeks later. There's always about 20 of my shows in archives. Uh, and uh, I'm having a lot of fun doing it. And it's led, now I've started a television show on a different network here locally in Manhattan. And in August, I'm launching into Internet television, where I'm hoping to have and produce about 20 different shows on holistics, metaphysics, consciousness things, arts, uh, just to see what the universe needs me to do most. Beautiful. And, and I am trying, well, no, I'm going to rephrase that. I am heading in the same direction eventually. I will get there. Yeah. Um, so the other, th- I was listening to your show. I listened to it quite often, and I really enjoyed your interview with Jean Houston. What an amazing woman! Oh, she is. I'm such a fan. Mm-hmm. Uh, her books, her books are really brilliant, and she really, her book on the Wizard of Oz and mythology and. Switching around was just like brilliant. It's just awesome how she's even yeah, showing him in the Wizard of Oz how it brings it to the everyday. So again, thank you for everything. You do have an amazing show and I highly recommend you listen to it because I always learn something and, uh, thank you. it's, it's always fun to, you know, I'm all about education as a Sag. <laughs> I always got to mm-hmm. learn something. Um, so what are some of the upcoming things that are coming up for you? I mean, you're always doing lectures and classes and you mentioned about the TV show coming up. Is there anything else coming up for you? Well, that has me chasing my tail enough, I think, but I'm right now researching and we're going to launch a 28 show series on autism. 
uh, because autism is really rampant now. One mm-hmm. in every 81 babies is autistic. And But we're taking it from the point of view of what does a family do if they have a family member with autism? How do you effectively help the child integrate? You know, autistic people are highly, highly intelligent. It's just yes. to our perspective, they seem totally dysfunctional. Well, if you could help them function, they have an awful lot of love and intelligence to express. So that's a kind of a labor of love that I'm doing right now, and we're hoping to launch the show in late August, early September. And uh, I'm uh, right now also involved uh, here in New York with some art exhibits uh, that, uh, you know, there's amazing. Art is really the doorway to higher consciousness, and there's a mm-hmm. fabulous artist that you have had actually on your show. His name is Jason yes. Popkin. And uh, he is having the most wonderful success with the most moving, beautiful exhibition of his paintings here, uh, which he's sharing uh, with another artist from Greece. And uh, the, it's just amazing. And Jason is about to take off and go to Paris shortly. Uh, mm-hmm. There are new career opportunities there, and he'll commute back and forth. But I just love my real mission in life is I'm kind of like a – a warrior, bodyguard, nurturer for artists. Artists need to be taken care of. And while Jason is a very uh, self-realized gentleman, Mm -hmm. uh, his painting needs exposure. It's got to get out there. And so all my years as an arts administrator, promoter, lecturer, I'm trying to just add some wind to the sails of these great unemerged uh, artists you know they're not common knowledge yet but they will be you mark my words so i want everyone to google jason potvin p-o-t-v-i-n and you will see some of the most amazing work and not only that i get so jealous because he's a brilliant writer he's a brilliant composer uh, and he's just an all-around renaissance man so and i thank you for also being one of the stepping stones to bring him to the public's awareness uh, he uh, is he is an amazing man and so young. Yes. For being yes. as realized as he is, his writing blows me away. So mm-hmm. check out his website, listen to the interview. Um I, yes. I, I I was just blown away by actually he's just and he's down to earth. <laughs> yes. He I, wants to bring these higher perspectives into human uh reality. Uh, he's got a young body, perhaps, by my standards anyway, but he's a very old soul. Very. And he's full of this amazing love, and he just lives by and teaches by example that love is the glue of the universe, really. It's a cosmic force. But right. he really does pour it into his paintings and his writings and his music. Mm-hmm. So all of you listeners, please go and do yourself a favor and Google Jason Potvin, P-O-T-V-I-N dot com, and you'll really make a contact of someone I think you'll find as a catalyst for your own awakening. Definitely. Um, met him through a mutual friend. I'm not even talking to the mutual friend, so it's like I was destined to meet Jason, and he has been such a supporter of, of my writing and my work, mm-hmm. and, and I support him 150%. Anything I can do for the man, he is... He's just one of those, he's almost, he's definitely like an indigo, but a crystal child that's really going to help change the world. And I nurture and help him as much as I can as you, because like you, um, art really is here for a reason. It's really the sanest thing we can do is support the art, um, because it is such a high vibe and it really brings sanity into the, from the chaos and even the abstract right. art that he does there's just such a subtle calmness within it he's in, he's just amazing in many many ways yeah. so i Absolutely. agree with you mm-hmm. it, it, so high five my friend on that one yeah um so we have taken enough of your time so i thank you very much i know you got a lot to do um, with your day and so Monty Taylor again 
open invitation anytime you want to talk about, if you want to come back and talk about your your TV show, your radio show, whatever. Oh, I'd love to, sure. And Just, uh, we should have you on my radio show one of yeah, these days. That'd be great. Um, mm-hmm. So with that, I thank you very much. It's awesome. Thank you for the opportunity, Jennifer. I know you have a lot of loving beings out there listening to you, and thanks for being the spark that keeps the fires going for us. I thank you very much. Um, okay. Have a great day. You too. Enjoy. Thanks again. Thank you. Bye-bye.